welcome uh, to this very special event. It's great to be here in Bombay. And our two guests this afternoon are two of this country's biggest stars in fashion and entertainment. So would you all join me in welcoming Deepika Padukone and Sabya Sachi Mukherjee. Thank you. So there's so many things I want to cover today. Um, but I have to start with the wedding. Okay. And um, there are so many curious minds about the Indian wedding, both here in India, and as I mentioned, the idea of the Indian wedding kind of went global in the last 12 months with all of these big prominent weddings. So just to begin with, Deepika, I wanted to understand, you know, last year you got married to Ranveer, and um, as a recent Indian bride, I was hoping you could explain to everyone, you know, what is the significance of the Indian wedding here in India? Why is it such a big deal? I, I think there are various reasons why, at least from a bride's point of view, it's, um, it's always that sort of moment in your life that you look forward to. So I'm not sure if it's a girl thing or if it's, uh, or if it's an Indian thing, but it's definitely a thing, at least from my point of view, that you know, your wedding is sort of you know, that, that one big day when you, that you look forward to in your life and you also want to look your best. Why is it important? I think also because it, it sort of takes you into the next phase of your life. You know, I think from your, you know, from the time you're born till about whatever, 20, 30, whenever you get married, I feel like that's, that's one stage of your life. And when you get married to somebody, that's, you're, you're entering into a different phase and, and a very and sort of unknown territory. You don't know, while you know the person, um, the coming together of two very... Uh, you know, distinct and different individuals coming together and what that life together is going to be like, I think is always, it's exciting, it's intimidating, um, and it's a new chapter in your life. Right. And then, of course, with Indian culture, it's not just about the two people coming together, but the families coming together as well. And at least for me and in the way that the two of us have been brought up, that for us was an equally important part of the two of us coming together. Uh, because we're both, we've been brought up in a way where family is extremely important. It's, it, it's, it's a part of our core. It's, it's, a, it's a part of who we are. And the families, uh, you know, being on the same page, understanding each other culturally, uh, or in the way that we've been brought up, family values, all of those things were, uh, were very, very important to us. Um, so while on the outside, we look like two completely different people, at the core of it, we're actually exactly the same. And so I think that's what it is. And I feel like, you know, I'm always, I, I also moved out of home at a very young age. Um, I played professional badminton when, you know, all through my schooling years until I was 16. And then I moved to Mumbai uh, to, to pursue my career in, in modeling and then in acting. So I led a large part of my growing up years alone. And so I think, the, the want to uh, be with somebody, to come home to somebody, and to have a family, um, I think for me was, was very, very important. Uh, so this is, this is my perspective, okay. and that, that's my point of view. Okay, so Sabia, you have literally worked with thousands, if not tens of thousands of brides. And Deepika has very nicely articulated the importance of the wedding in India, the, the union of two individuals the union of two families, but that is also a big business here, you know? And, you know, the, the first time I really got exposed to this, I went to some couture shows, went, uh, you know, bridal couture shows in Delhi, and the market estimates were that the, the wedding business in India is worth more than $40 billion a year. And when I explain that to people outside India, they're, you know, it boggles the mind. So can you explain to us a little bit about what constitutes that huge sum of money? Like, why are people spending, so, you know, everyone, you know, everyone from all parts of society here, they spend a lot of money on weddings. Why is that? Simran, uh, we are a very emotional country and we like all sorts of celebration festivals. And as far as, you know, when Mark Zuckerberg decided to uh, uh, discover Facebook, 
I think it, it was definitely in his mind that human psyche uh, relied on two very different things. One was uh, voyeurism and the other was exhibitionism. You know, if I keep aside sentiment, if I keep aside religion, if I keep aside uh, our value systems, I think what's happened with, uh, the, uh, with weddings in India is it's become a premise for both voyeurism and exhibitionism. And uh, I think also, if you, if you look at most weddings in India, they, they are kind of, uh, you know, they are kind of used to establish social and financial hierarchy. And also at the same time, uh, uh, you know, like other, other people have, like other countries have a lot of, uh, lot of events where people can wear couture clothing. Like, you know, they, they have things like Met Gala, they have opera. In India, unfortunately, you know, most of the couture consumption is only the five or six days of weddings. I know many families who actually, uh, you know, they shop for their clothing first, and then they realize that they've fallen short of uh, events, and they create events to wear their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's not just about the clothing, right? You've recently moved into the jewelry space. It's, you know, it's the event, it's flying the guests down, it's the jewelry, it's the whole celebration. You know, what are the other elements that constitute yeah, you were going to say Deepika. That's Sabya being OCD. Right. He got into the jewelry business not to make money. He got into the jewelry business because he sees his outfit. And then there was a time when it was his outfit and some random jewelry. And I think he couldn't stand the fact that the bride was wearing his clothes with jewelry that didn't match his sensibility. And so he was like, I might as well just give them the jewelry also. So how do you, how That's do you the react inside to story. that, Sabya? No, you know, I, I remember... Bandana Tiwari, she was at Vogue at that point of time. And, you know, I had this big debacle with Vidya Balan at yeah. Khan. And, uh, you know, sadly, I was treated as a national terrorist overnight. <laughs> and so, so I, I went to her and I said, you know, there's only that much that we can control because of the fact that there are stylists and then things happen, shit happens. And she said, no, shit doesn't happen because when you're giving an outfit to somebody, you're responsible for the image and you have to own up to that responsibility. And I said, well done. You know, it stayed in my head. And I decided that, you know, slowly and slowly and slowly, I will start controlling the entire image. So, you know, after jewelry, probably we'll get into beauty. We'll get into other things. And like, for instance, uh, you know, when we do clothing now, our, uh, like, you know, the design philosophy is Instagram first. Because girls, when they come into our stores, you know, they look at pictures on our iPads. They ask us to uh, click them in five different lengas. And if they're having a, a wedding, which is a destination wedding, they go outside, get themselves clicked on, on sunlight. And for many of them, their choices of clothing depends on how beautiful the pictures are uh, looking. So, you know, it, it's almost, you know, fashion has almost become like costume design. For many people, actually, which is one of the reasons suddenly there's this sudden increase in monotones, you know, prints are getting bolder. There's a big influx of 80s because anything that is bright, big, and bold, bold and beautiful, rather than intricate, is going to, uh, take better, uh, shoot better pictures. You know, for everybody, this entire notion of exhibi exhibitionism has become so strong. You know, the entire world is now divided into voyeurs and exhibitionists. And I think the entire fashion principle, the wedding principle is all, all kind of based on that. Okay. So let's get into a little bit of the detail here because last year you got married. Um, and I, I just wanted to understand, so how, first of all, did, did the two of you come together to plan and execute this incredible series of events that you did, Deepika. You know, what, what was, what was the, what was the, how did you first decide that, you know, Sabya Sachi was going to be one of the chosen ones, as it were? I always knew. I always knew 10 years ago when I was a model. I, I, so this is even before he became like, uh, people wanted to be the Sabya Sachi bride. Um, when I was a model, and I think, you know, a, a large part of my exposure to his work was back then, more than 10 years ago, actually. And that's when I'd already decided that whenever I get married, he was definitely one of the designers that I wanted to work with. Um, of course, then it's a different thing that for almost every function of mine, I wore his clothes. So I was, I, I've always been very clear about that. Then comes sort of actually picking up the phone and telling him that I'm getting married. So... It was my parents, obviously. We had decided the date. And the very first person I called and I was ready to tell was him. So my stylist didn't know. Uh, friends didn't know. 
nobody knew. So other than the immediate family, he was the first person I told. And he knew that you know, for, for quite a few months uh, before we actually let other people in, sort of start working on the, on the wedding. And um, I think you know, we were both very, very clear that I wanted it to be very traditional very, very traditional. And, and I think also because we wanted to, there's a certain look that people associate with him, um, but we also kind of moved away from that. It, it was about bringing in his sensibility and his aesthetic, but keeping in mind the part of the country where I come from as well. Uh, and that's why we had two separate ceremonies. We had the Anand Karat ceremony to, uh, to sort of welcome and embrace the culture that Ranveer belongs to. And I'm a South Indian, and I was very, very clear that I wanted to do a Kanjivaram sari. And, you know, so that's how we sort of um, worked on, you know, getting these two looks very, very different. And I think even just the way he went about sourcing and, and, and uh, you know, researching, and um, if I'm not mistaken, there were pieces of, like, antique fabric and, like, stuff that you'd probably not find uh, you know, in a in a regular market is is I mean that's the kind of sort of detail. Yes, it's a different thing now that people are copying that, and we knew that would happen. But um, uh, but you know, it's it's it was very very intricate. It was something that you know there was a lot of detail and something that I I was also very clear that I wanted the family of red on both the days. That you, I mean, I think we all know that in Indian weddings, red is sort of a very, very significant color for, uh, for the bride. And we did sort of um, contemplate doing, you know, maybe two different colors on both th uh, the days. But I think as we got closer, I was very, very clear about wanting red on, you know, both the ceremonies uh, that we had. Mm -hmm. And Sabia, from your side, when you get that call from Deepika Padukone, you know, what, what's your reaction and how do you go and respond to working with a, a bride like this who clearly is very demanding and has a very clear vision of what she wants, but also you want to put your own stamp on it and you're thinking of that image, right? That image that's going to be beamed all around the world. Well, when Deepika called, and it's not because of her, the first thing that flashed into my head was, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Because you see, I did Anushka's wedding before that. And these weddings, you have to be... You know, we, we, keep, we do a lot of celebrity weddings. But, you know, in India, when you're doing the wedding of a movie star, you know, then you are very worried the secrets will go out. And I was like, you know, when we did Anushka's wedding, there was a month that we had with Dipika's. There were six. And... <laughs> Everybody was speculating. I mean, she and Ranveer must have got married in the press about 50 times before she was actually married. Every time there was a new date that came in, and I used to text her. I said, you know what? Is this true? Is this true? <laughs> I promise you that nothing's going out from my factory. She said, don't worry. This is just the press. You know, the first thing that I told myself that I need a code word because of the fact that I was traveling all the time and to keep a secret for six months, because you see, when we do a bridal outfit, there are a lot of people that work. You know, there's a pattern making team. There's an embroidery team. There's a pattern cutting team, there's a dyeing team, there's a sourcing team, there's a textile team, there's the jewelry team. I was like, no way could I keep this a secret. So I said, okay, fine, we have to find a name, we have to find a name. And for some, you know, I'm, I'm quite a smart guy, but you know, th at that point of time, I got really stupid. And the first name that came out of my mouth was Naomi Campbell. I said, Naomi's getting married, she's getting married to an Indian guy. <laughs> because I, you know, I was just thinking of, that, you know, when the measurements come, you know, who else is going to be 5 feet 11 inches tall? <laughs> and, so, and I remember my assistants looking at me and saying, really? You know, and I said, you know, and I don't know why I blurted that out. So you kept out. it a secret from your team as well? From everybody. And uh, a few people uh, from the Mumbai store, because that's where Deepika used to come secretly for her measurements. And I was terrified that there would be some press oh, hanging Deera somewhere. Deera over there, looking <laughs> outside. <laughs> no, we were terrified and I... I kept telling Deepika that come in a burkha. And Deepika said, if I come in a burkha, that's when I will get spotted. Right. And we'll, anyway, she'll tell you about the Italian paparazzi later, <laughs> how she cheated them. And uh, so Sabina from our Mumbai store and a few more people who was helping her with measurements and everybody knew. But most people in my factory, because there are 1,800 people at work there, thought it was Naomi Campbell getting married to an Indian prince. <laughs> well, that is an interesting tidbit that I don't think anybody knew. Um, 
So Deepika, from your perspective... I've never spoken so much about the wedding. I know. Well, that's why we're here, trust me. Um, you know, further to Sabya's point, you know, keeping this a secret and, you know, maintaining privacy around what is a, you know, you know, it's a personal moment, but you also know it's going to become this big thing. Like, how do you, how did, A, how did you keep it a secret on your side? And then B, how did you decide what you wanted ultimately to share? Again, okay, so the first part. The, the not wanting to share was not about not wanting to share, but about, want, uh, but about the, the need to sort of move around freely because there's so much, and I almost sing single-handedly did the entire wedding. Uh, Ranveer was busy. He said if we wanted to get married last year, um, you know, he was doing three or four films back to back. Uh, fortunately, he made, you know, he, he managed to take the time out for that but he had literally no time before and after. So it kind of, yes, I had the support of my father-in-law and my mother, but, uh, you know, and there was a, uh, uh, Ranveer's grandmother was unwell, so his parents were busy with that. So there was just a lot, like, So going, you there basically was a, managed the whole thing. Orchestrated the whole yeah. thing. And then, um, so it was about just trying to get things done, and I felt like, and we, 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 we were not planning to keep it a secret and then suddenly sort of put a picture out and then say, hey, we're married. We were very clear that we were going to make an announcement before the wedding happened, but only in a time when we felt like we had things under control. Otherwise, it's like going to jewelers or, you know, picking up shoes or just basic stuff because it's not just about me, but there's so, there were so many other people involved, our family, sisters, fathers. I mean, there was just so much to be done on the wedding front. Um, so it was about being able to move around freely, which we did manage to do, actually. Um, and sure, of course, there was a lot of speculation, in fact, much closer to the wedding. But, and then once we felt like, OK, everything was under control and, and most of the things had been done, is when we then sort of put out um, an announcement. Um, what was the other question? Well, the, the, it was about keeping it a secret, but it was also like how you kind of managed everything. And it sounds like you took a lot of time. You must have taken time off work. I had anyway taken time off work yeah. because I think the last year was important for me to just sort of replenish uh, emotionally um, and just do the things that I wanted to do, things that made me and my soul happy and not sort of be on a schedule and constantly be available to other people. I just wanted to do things that I wanted to do. Um, so I, I had taken that year off professionally anyway. And, and then we decided to also do the wedding. So it kind of, it's not like I took the time off to get married, if that makes any sense. And also creatively, nothing was exciting. And it just didn't make sense to be on a film set if I wasn't going to be happy making the movies that, you know, that, that I was being offered. So it kind of just fell into place. Also, I'm an extremely, um, I'm a perfectionist. You know, I like, I like to do things a certain way. And that time, the six months or the eight months that we had allowed me to sort of get into every single detail. I'm glad you said that because at one point, Sabya, you said, she scares me. <laughs> Deepika scares me because of the fact that I think she is so organized that, you know, I pride myself in being organized, but she is so meticulous, so organized, and so composed about everything that she makes me look like a rookie. What was it like on your side, you know, working and organizing everything? You know, honestly, it was wonderful because sometimes the most painful thing that can happen to a designer and why you get bridezilla moments is because the brides don't know what they want. Sometimes they don't even know why they're getting married and who they're getting married to. <laughs> and, yeah. And Deepika knew everything. She knew who she was getting married to, why she was getting married. She knew the color of her outfit. She knew what jewelry she wanted to wear, the flowers. She knew the Idli and the uh, South Indian coffee that would be served to guests when they walk, wake, uh, woke up every morning. By the way, they flew down all their caterers from South India. She knew the venue. She knew the color palette. She knew exactly what the guests would wear. I was given a mood board. Oh. <laughs> that was you. No, no, but that I created one. <laughs> so, uh, and at the same time, she was very, very... Uh, Oh, by the way, I also have to tell you, I'm a foodie because I'm a Bengali, I can't help it. I love food. I've never had the kind of food that was served in Deepika's wedding ever, anywhere. I mean, I don't know, she even went for, Ranvi told me that she went for multiple food tastings. Twelve. Twelve. And she, the food was just right. 
it it wasn't too less it wasn't too much it was just very well curated sure. the venue was perfect you know it and at the same time it was such a big wedding in in its stature but you know if you look at the physical wedding it was very small very intimate very cultured and they all had people around them that mattered to them that was a part of the immediate family and i think that's how weddings should be organized okay. So, you know, in, in the West, you know, we've recently had these huge weddings, right? We, you know, we had uh, Meghan Markle's wedding, and she was dressed by Givenchy. And we had Kate Middleton's dress, uh, wedding, and she was dressed by McQueen. And we even had Chiara Ferragni, this big Italian blogger who was dressed by Dior. And the impact on their business was huge. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, so after these pictures go out all over the world, what happens, you know, and... What happens to your business? Is there an instant reaction? Are people asking for the Deepika look? Like, what happens? I think, you know, what happened, what the, the good thing was that, you know, when me and Deepika uh, kind of worked on the wedding outfit together, she was very, I was very relieved that she wanted to wear something very traditional. And I knew that the impact that this wedding would happen, uh, ha have on the economy, because, uh, you know, her wedding look, was very culturally and socially accessible. Like, you know, a lot of girls could go with that tear sheet of a wedding outfit and go to, uh, go to multiple stores across the country where they would buy a counterfeit outfit. But which also meant, because the outfits were entirely handcrafted, we had Gota, Kirna, Zardozi, which, you know, you know, when I was talking to Deepika about the wedding, much before the wedding actually happened, I said, you know, the, what I'm most excited about the fact that your wedding is going to create so many jobs at craft level for so many people. And I don't know how many me so are we sold, but I know that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of replicas being sold every day, even as we speak, from, from the north to the west to the east to the south. And, I, and, and the fact that you know, this wedding, probably in some small way or big way, helped us align jobs back to our craftsmen was, I think, was probably something that me and Deepika could do a high five on. Mm. Before we move on to my next topic, I also wanted to talk about weddings in light of social progress. So I'm not sure if you heard, but um, in Taiwan this week, uh, Taiwan became the first Asian country to legalize gay marriage. And you know, I know Section 377, which previously criminalized homosexuality here in India, was recently um, shot, um, shot down by the Supreme Court here in India. Do you think there will be a time, Sabya and Deepika, where you know, you know, gay couples can get married in the same, with the same kind of celebration and the same kind of you know, unity and you know, union of two families as, as straight couples? I don't think we should be even waiting for the time. The time is now, and I think the government should recognize that because you know, uh, not letting people come together uh, legally I think is a violation of human rights. Deepika? No, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it feels strange to me that we even have to have this, you know, to be asked that question and, and the fact that we need, even need to address it. Um, um, so we shouldn't even allow ourselves to be in this place, you know, where somebody else uh, dictates how you want to spend or who you want to spend the rest of your life with. Yeah. It's this interesting thing right now I see with India where, you know, even with both of your careers, right? So you're both huge stars here, um, making a splash abroad, you know, trying to build global careers, but you're kind of straddling two different contexts and cultures as well, right? So, you know, Sabia, you and I first met, I think, 12 or 13 years ago when you were in New York trying to, you know, set up a, a fashion business that would be targeted to the West. Deepika, you, you and I recently bumped into each other uh, in New York, and you were there on the, in, on the red carpet at the Met Gala. And you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to learn how you guys think about straddling these two parts of your careers, where, you're, where you have this huge established presence here, and you're, you're also dabbling in international careers as well. You want to go first? OK. So I went to New York uh, when I was a rookie, and I I miserably failed. I had a business, but it was not a business that was large enough to sustain or uh, keep up with the ambitions that I had. And I just realized that, you know, 
I needed to come back to India, become a stronger voice, and then probably I would take the journey much later. And at that point of time, I was reading a book, and it was very inspirational because you know they, they used uh, there was a very famous Bengali poet, Madhusudan Datta, who actually used uh, uh, fancied himself as being a poet who wrote poetry in English till somebody very close to him said that you are not going to ever be successful unless you learn to write poetry in your mother language. And he wrote this most amazing poem, which has probably become a literature icon in Bengal. So I came back and I started thinking about the fact that, you know, if I needed to do something uh, in India, I needed to do something which had an Indian voice, which was about Indian crafts and culture. And at that point of time, Susie Menkes came in as a godmother and a mentor. I remember meeting her in London and she's saying, why would you even chase the Western market when you have the biggest market is right at your doorstep? And I, I just put my blinkers on and I focused on building a, building a business in India. And I said that when I go back next time uh, internationally, I will go back when I've done in enough body of work in India for them to take me seriously so that I could go back at my own terms and do things that I exactly wanted to do. And, and now you are doing that, right? So what are your international ambitions, Sabya? Well, uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to create a global beauty brand out of India. Because you see, uh, uh, I think, you know, there are certain things that, uh, there are certain things that India rightfully owns. The tradition of beauty is very strong. So I want to create a global beauty brand out of India. I want to have Sabisachi fragrances selling at every single important counter. At uh, stage two would be to take the jewelry. And stage three would be, you know, like I'm a gypsy at heart. So I'll probably do a season free clothing, you know, almost on the lines of something that you would get in flea markets all over the world and do a very small line of edited vintage clothing with an Indian soul that would sell in some of the important stores that I think I should be selling at. Okay. And you, Deepika, so when you, you know, you're, you're spending a lot more time abroad now, you know, and you, know, you have this US Vogue cover and you know, you're, you're at the, on the red carpet in Cannes and you're doing the Met Gala, but like, what are you trying to do internationally and how does that you know, sit alongside this, this career you mm. have here? I think that, um, I think it's really about embracing who you are and where you come from and making that sort of visible um, and making that visible globally versus trying to set foot in, in, a, in, a, in a land or in a, in a culture that you don't really understand. Um, and had that, you know, had we had this conversation maybe 10 years ago, that would have probably been the case. And I think everyone needed to physically move with bag and baggage if you actually wanted to break into another territory, um, you know, or, or become part of another sort of industry, you needed to move with bag and baggage. Today, you don't need to do that because the world's just, I mean, become smaller, but also become bigger in, in so many ways. And it's really about embracing, you know, everything that I've done here and everything that I stand for. And, and hence the Vogue cover. Um, they talk about global influencers. And that's exactly, you know, what I'm on the journey to sort of uh, do or accomplish or... Um, sort of leave behind. Um, I've never been someone who can sort of, you know, cut the cord and, and move. Um, I was very clear that, you know, if I do get married, I will get married to someone from India. Um, I, I always knew that, you know, while I can work, and it's not just about America, it's about working outside of India. Yeah. Um, that, sure, it, it, it requires a lot of travel, um, but I would never move. Uh, out of out of where I come from and where I belong. Do, do you when you both travel abroad? Do you feel like there's a growing understanding of India, or is it still this kind of kind of mystical place with you know spirituality and you know how has it changed the understanding of people in the West or in other parts of Asia and 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 beyond? Like, what do you think the world understands about India now? Somewhere maybe. The, you know, the Netflixes of the world or the, the Amazons of the world are probably responsible for doing that. But today, three years ago, when I went to one of these sort of, uh, you know, uh, parties, someone actually said, oh, you speak English really well. Or, 
you know, which part of India do you come from or where is India? Or like, you know, I had people ask me these really bizarre questions about where India is located on the map or the fact that we speak a certain way um, versus two months ago when you take a meeting, they know exactly where India is, uh, the, the work or let's, they probably don't know the details of it, right? But they at least know the number of movies that we're making or the fact that we're one of the largest you know, filmmaking industries in the world um, or the fact that today India really matters, whether it's fashion, whether it's film, whether it's uh, business. Um, technology. Technology. Yeah. You know, so you, I think the bottom line is today, whatever profession you are in or whichever part of the world you are in, India cannot be ignored. Sabia? Uh, so I'll speak from a fashion perspective. For the longest time, India was the backyard of uh, manufacturing for global brands. But right now the tables have turned and India after China is becoming the strongest emerging consumer market. And I think, I think internationally, big brands, uh, investors, finances, uh, everybody, they're grappling with the new reality of how the tables have turned and how something that was the backyard of manufacturing has become the front end, front end of the consumer market. And I, I think people look at India with a, you know, earlier when I used to go to uh, go, uh, go outside the country, invariably the first question that used to be asked to me was the fact that how do you speak such good English? Yeah, same as Deepika. Same. Yeah, they'd yeah. always ask that. That was, a, uh, that, you know, that, you know, there was this exotic wonderment about the country and now, right now, India is reg not regarded as one of those things. You know, like India has become finally mainstream. Earlier, Indian fashion, uh, you know, Indian influences were considered to be seasonal or exotic at best. But right now, people realize that it's a mainstream economy. And, you know, like, uh, you know, I was given a presentation once called Asia First, where they say that you know, uh, uh, by 20, 2030 or 2040, China followed by India are going to be the two largest markets in the world. And, and you know, the real business is here because if you, if you look at, you know, I was, you, you know, what people, uh, you know, we were talking about the wedding market. The wedding market alone in India right now is actually at $50 billion, which is the second largest compared to America. And the most interesting thing part about the wedding market is the average age, size, age of a bride in India is 21 and the average groom age, groom's age is 23. And for most people, their first consumption of luxury, whether it's their first piece of heavy jewelry, it's their first branded handbag, it's their first, uh, you know, I have seen many girls who have worn mascara for the first time on their wedding. So their journey of luxury actually starts with the wedding market. And, and today, India has become such a force to reckon with, both in terms of consumption and manufacturing, that I, I think that it'll be only stupid of the world to ignore it. Mm. I mean, Deepika mentioned all of the progress we've seen in technology and business and, you know, in, in entertainment and visibility. I wonder how you feel um, the re-election of Prime Minister Modi is going to impact the future economic progress of India S alongside social progress. So we touched on LGBT rights earlier in weddings. I see a dichotomy here. I see an economy that's advancing and a country that's advancing from an economic standpoint at you know, you know, the fastest pace in the world, you know, it outstrips China. But then I see that alongside growing social conservatism. How do you, how do you reconcile those two things? You know, Imran, I would just like to say one thing here is the fact that you know, if I were to choose between both, I would first choose economic growth because economic growth actually leads to empowerment in many levels and then people can start making social changes on their own. We cannot forget about the fact that this is the largest democracy in the world. And once people get more and more powerful, I think any sort of regression will be dealt with by the people at large. Um, I want to conclude um, by talking about something um, that's really important. And you know, we have a lot of young people who read BOF and who listen to our podcast and who will be watching this online. And, they look up to people like you because you've both found success. Um, I, I was exchanging messages with Deepika last night on, on WhatsApp about this con Japanese concept of ikigai. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone here knows what ikigai is, but it, it roughly translate in, translates into this idea of a reason for being, which is made up of four key parts, which is what you love, 
what you're good at, what you can be paid for, and what the world needs. And when I look at two people in this country who've really achieved that kind of success, who found that, my that mythical ikigai, I, you know, I think it, arguably you both have. But I think what, a lot, of, what a, a lot of people don't recognize is even for very, very, very successful people, it doesn't come easy. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit of advice. I mean, Deepika, you, you mentioned earlier that until the age of 16, you played professional badminton, and I think, I think your father was a big badminton star, right? So, so many of us go on these journeys where we end up following the dreams of our parents. Yes. You know, and you get, how is it that you, you know, started in badminton and then t you know, had the courage and you know, tenacity to carve your own path? Wow. Um, at no point do I ever remember my parents imposing their dreams on us. Okay. It was always about go to school, do the best that you can do, uh, take part in every sort of extracurricular activity that there was to offer. Um, you know, then we'd come back. Um, I've done uh, jazz, ballet, whatever classes, Bharatnatyam, uh, just things that, that were outside of sort of sitting in a classroom, and, and including sport. And my parents, uh, you know, sort of exposed us to that. And they allowed us to sort of figure our way or figure out what we want to do with our lives on our own. Why did I play badminton? Because it, it sort of was treated like another extracurricular activity. You come back from school, um, you know, papa's on the courts. Why don't you all go there and just play around for a bit? And even before I realized... Um, I was playing professional badminton, but there was absolutely no pressure from anybody or expectation from me to do that. Sure. Um, while on that journey, I, you know, I was exposed to like the Miss Indias or you know television or um, the f literally the very few movies that we would watch in a year because we didn't we didn't grow up watching too many films, and I'd watch these movies or watch these heroines on screen and always. It felt familiar. It felt like I was going to be there doing that one day. Um, so it's it's kind of it's weird. It's it's not like I, you know, it's not not to say that I didn't work hard, but somewhere I felt I feel like this was destined to happen. Um, and I was always very clear as a child about what I wanted to do, um, and who I wanted to be, and you know, sort of all of that. It's a different thing that when I joined the industry, I did lose my way for a, for a bit. I felt like I didn't know enough and, uh, you know, certainly made mistakes with my film choices. Um, and then I think those sort of mistakes led me to where I am today and I think it, it really taught me a lot. How, so, you know, how do you get through those hard moments? Because I think, you know, there's been a wider conversation, thankfully, in the world around mental health. Yeah. And you've spoken quite openly in the past about periods of your life that were really challenging. You know, how, how do you get through that? I think uh, to, uh, A, to be extremely patient. I feel like, you know, in certain ways, we're, we're, as a world, we're progressing. But in a lot of ways, we're also becoming less patient as people. And we want instant. Everything has to be now. Everything has to be instant. And I think, um, you know, on the road to recovery, at least, um, acceptance um, patience and um, hope, you know, and you have to have people around you that you trust, your family and friends, most importantly, who support you through this, you know, through this journey. Mm -hmm. And I think having, having experienced depression, it really makes you understand uh, truly, and I'm not, not in a way to sort of romanticize it, but you, you really value life. I was driving, you know, coming here on the sea link and I, you know, put my phones away and everything and I was just looking out at the sea and, and, and the sun, it was beautiful. How often do we do that? Yeah. How often do we look up? Yeah. We've, we've stopped looking up. We're yeah. always looking down. Yeah. Um, just simple things like that. I just feel like, um, you know, you start valuing, you know, certain things that you probably just take for granted otherwise. Sabia? So, I mean, we've spoken about this before, but Deepika and me have something in common. We've both suffer, suffered and overcome serious depression. 
I went through a period of depression when I was very young. For seven and a half years, I had to leave school. I tried committing suicide. You know, my parents found me at the nick of time. And I think what it did was it, it taught me many things. It first taught me the importance of introspection. And you know, as sensitive and creative people, the most important thing that you battle all your life is this uh, fine line between art and commerce. And you know, as, as, I, as you grow your brand, I think for everybody, like there are many creative people in this room, I think the biggest frustration is, you know, we always think that commerce is a bad word, but I would say no, because I think that to be able to balance art and commerce and to cre create a path where you can keep your idealism alive is the way forward. And, uh, you know, I, like, you know I, I know my influence in the Indian wedding market, and I know, like, you know, if, if my if my brand is worth X times, like my copy market is probably ten thousand times more than that, <laughs> and just by being able to do a breath line, I could have cashed in on the weddings. I could have created a breath line. I could have done a collaboration with one of those big giants or with Amazon and started something like a flash sale, and made a lot of money in the short term. But you know, Imran, I have said no to investors. I you know, I've annoyed people within my factory because I've said no to disorganic growth for the longest time because I think that when you build a brand and if you want to build, you know, I want to build a brand out of India that can last like what Chanel did. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a very small story that, you know, uh, Nandana Sen, Amartya Sen's daughter, you know, I did some clothes for her. So as a gift, she gave me a 1921's edition of Vogue. And I was flipping through that magazine and I started crying at the end of the magazine because on the 140th or 150th page, there was a small little ad that said that we are open for business in Bond Street and it was Tiffany. And every single advertiser in that anniversary issue, I didn't even know what their names were. I did not even know these brands existed. And I told myself that this is not going to happen to my brand. My brand has to live far beyond my lifetime. I want to create a brand that India can be very proud of. You know, one of my big ideals is Ratan Tata. I want to be able to create something like him. I would want to chase value more than money. And so for that, for 20 years of my life, I put my head down. And I believe today we are going to build a 100-store building. But in, in 20 years, I've just created the foundation of the building. Now it's time to rise. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um. That's all we have time for today. I want to try to keep on time. But um, I think you'll all agree with me that India can be very proud of these two exceptional individuals. I'm so um, thrilled that the, you were, we were able to make this work at the last minute. Uh, and I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. Um, we just threw this together in like a week. Yes. <laughs> um, so we filled the room. I want to thank everyone at Soho House, Vidisha, and her team for helping us. There's also Nikhil Mansata and his team that help bring this together. Um, and, and most of all, Sabya Sachi, Deepika, thank you for inspiring us, for sharing your stories, for being vulnerable, uh, and for being here with me today. So thank you, everyone. All right, thanks.